thus begin. Right. Our next presenter is Father Paul Nicholson, and you will remember that he uh, preached during the Mass this morning, and I, like you, would have enjoyed that homily extremely. Shh. Thank you. Father Nicholson is from London, Ontario, and for those of you who know your Canadian geography, you'll be able to place that immediately. Any difficulty with that? Father will provide the context. <laughs> but you know that uh, uh, Father's going to, uh, the theme of his uh, talk today is, is uh, St. Joseph, a model for our life, or a model for life. My memory is that St. Joseph is the patron saint of Canada. Am I right? For, am I right? Yeah, got it. He is, yeah. spot on. I get 10 out of 10 for that. <laughs> so he is indeed. But also, but this is a part that took my immediate attention. Um, Father is extraordinarily interested in the welfare of young persons. And so am I, as I alluded to earlier, but I got the context wrong. And I know that so many of our young people are deprived of their Catholic culture and their heritage, and there seems little that we can do about it. But Father is spending a great deal of his priestly life in the Ministry for Young Persons. Welcome, please, Father Paul Nicholson. Thank you very kindly. It's very kind. I'm going to uh, walk around freely and hopefully not run off the edge of the stage. That would be most dramatic. I am uh, very pleased and privileged to be with you, uh, Kiwi and Tongans and Fijians and Australians and all of you who belong to Oceania. I'm so privileged to be here. As it has been said, I am Father Paul Nicholson and I am a parish priest uh, in a small rural community outside of well, I guess the biggest metropolitan area would be London, Ontario. It is a small country parish where, in fact, I grew up. I'm actually in my home parish, and uh, uh, my mother is there, and all my brothers are there, and all my cousins are there. So they're most delighted when I take leave for a little vacation or a pilgrimage or a mission. They get to go to confession. <laughs> they, you know... I mean, I say to my mother, I said, what have you done in your life that causes you to have your son as the parish priest to listen to him chirping all the time? <laughs> Poor soul. Well, I am privileged to be here to speak to you about my patron of our country, of Canada, a glorious St. Joseph. And I have been on a bit of a little bit of a mission trip uh, around different parts of Canada and different places to speak about St. Joseph because I feel that St. Joseph has a very important role to play in our present situation, especially, especially for men, because I think that men often feel that the faith, as it is expressed and communicated, leaves them left out. They kind of feel that there's something missing in the translation. And so I take it upon myself to speak of St. Joseph, and I, I think it pleases our Blessed Lady very much uh, to speak of St. Joseph because uh, she feels very much that he did so many great services for her, so that to speak of him is to honor her, and I pray that my words today will in some way excite some young manly heart in this crowd to think of the Holy Priesthood. Nothing would please me more, nothing would please Our Lady more, that there would be a great resurgence of priestly vocations here in New Zealand. For New Zealand and from New Zealand, we must pray that there be an abundance of priestly vocations. So I'm going to begin by quoting to you a passage from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Now the origin of the Christ was in this wise. When Mary, his mother, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. But Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wishing to expose her to reproach, has mind to put her away privately. 
But while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Do not be afraid, Joseph, son of David, to take to thee Mary thy wife, for that which is begotten in her is of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to go too far afield into that passage. I think it is enough for us to stop there and meditate upon the greatness and the virtue of St. Joseph. You know St. Joseph is important. He's very important to this, this great mystery of redemption. Every single one of us, we were present on Calvary and we contributed to the death of Christ. But there is only one man who saved the life of Christ. It was St. Joseph. St. Joseph did so much for the Christ child that we could not cease to speak of all the marvels and wonders of this one particular individual. And the Holy Spirit has conserved for us these incidences, these brief images of his life. And one of them is this particular agony of St. Joseph. There he is. You can picture him. And he beholds and he witnesses clearly that the mother of God is with child. And he knows very well how the birds and the bees operate. <laughs> and he is looking at the situation, and our blessed lady does not say anything to him. She does not explain what has happened. That is incredible. You could say he had a right to know, but she had not been given leave by Almighty God to tell him. And he had to look at the situation and examine it for what it was. And some liberal, leaning, loopy-headed thinkers say, oh, well, he was going to, he was going to save his own reputation. And he was going to say, well, you've been messing around. I'm going to hit the road. You know, there's a lot of guys out there who do that kind of stuff today. They're more than happy to get a girl in trouble and then take their leave and be the man. Oh, yes, there are. Far too many of those kind of men exist in our culture. Irresponsible. And that is a big, big problem. But that is not what is happening in this passage. St. Bernardine of Siena and all the fathers seem to come to this conclusion that St. Joseph suspected the work of the divine. If you know the mother of God and I know the mother of God and we sense the mother of God in all her holiness and all her purity, can you imagine how much more this man of perfect virtue would ever for a moment think to himself, that she had been unfaithful, not on your life. Not on your life. St. Joseph wasn't thinking she was unfaithful. He had come to a conclusion in his mind that God had been at work. And so in his humility, he decides that he is going to do something that is what was considered completely unthinkable in his time. He was going to dismiss her privately, and then he was going to bear the reproaches of that time to a man who would get a woman in trouble and then hit the road. He was going to dismiss her quietly, and he was going to allow himself to be seen as a miserable wretch. Yeah, there was a time when a guy who would do such a thing would be considered a miserable wretch. And he was going to let all the opprobrium of old Judaism to fall upon him. And he was going to just simply allow that happening so that he would not find himself caught in a situation that was above, pardon the expression, his pay grade. If St. Peter was there at the miraculous catch of fish and detecting the divine said to the Lord, depart from me, Lord, for I am not worthy. I am a sinner. If St. Peter, who saw something miraculous like that, had that instantaneous reaction, don't you think, brothers and sisters, that it is most fitting and right that this tremendously holy and just man 
would sense the presence of God in all of this and say to himself, I cannot be part of this. This is beyond me. I will exclude myself. And that is precisely when in his sleep the angel of the Lord came to him and said, Do not be afraid, Joseph. Do not be afraid. You don't need to exclude yourself from this situation. God has seen your agony. And the child to be born of Mary is born of the Holy Spirit. And all of that trouble, all of that agony, that suffering was brought to a quick end. We are told that St. Joseph got up and took her as his wife. Some artists, uh, they try their hardest to depict uh, St. Joseph as to protect the undefiled chastity and purity of our Blessed Lady. And so they, they, have, they have painted him as an old man. <laughs> it was a common tradition among artists to show him as an old, feebled feller because they wanted to very much emphasize the spotless virginity and immaculate nature of our Blessed Lady's motherhood. As if to suggest that purity and chastity belongs to the old and the decrepit. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I think that's a grave injustice. And I also think it's horribly wrong. Can you imagine? I mean, look, we're still living in times in which we see a very elderly man with a very young woman, and we think, mm-hmm. <laughs> what on earth does she see in him? <laughs> Can you imagine St. Joseph being told to get up in the middle of the night and fly into Egypt? And the scriptures tell us he did not enter into any kind of argument with the angel. I mean, he could have. I mean, he was the legitimate descendant of David. Scripture scholars believe that if he had, if the throne had been still in existence, he would have been king of Israel. He could have been like Spartacus and said, oh, I am Spartacus. And all those who believe in the kingdom rally to my cause. He could have started an entire revolution knowing that this usurper named Herod was there to kill his son. But he didn't. If he'd been an old guy, he'd be being told by the angel, get up now, go into Egypt. <laughs> He's saying, where's my teeth? <laughs> it would have been a very tragic travel log, huh? He wasn't an old man by any means. And it is not true that chastity and purity belong to the old and the decrepit. Chastity, purity belongs to the young of heart because it is rooted in love. It is an affirmation. It is a yes to God and to others. It is by no means a negative. And wherever this idea came up, we must rebel against it and say, no, no. Purity, chastity, is very much for the young. And St. Joseph must have been young. He must have been in the fullness of his manhood at those particular moments when God needed him and asked him to be his guardian and his protector. And in that agony, you can imagine that he struggled with this whole thing, but he was so obedient, so docile to the plan of God that he did exactly what God wanted him to do. And Scripture does not tell us that he actually said anything. Is that not remarkable? What was that silence all about? Why does the word of Joseph not be found and recorded for us to meditate upon? If there was anybody who had a rich experience, he lived heaven on earth. He was their witness to the Word made flesh and to the spotless, immaculate virgin. If there was anyone who could sing a song and say a prayer, it would have been Saint Joseph. And yet the Holy Spirit says he said nothing. And I think sometimes that that is a very 
important thing for us to understand. Silence is not indifference. And silence is not inactivity. And for all us men, we need to know silence is not introversion. For us men, there has been this idea that has been circulated to be the strong, silent type. To be the introverted one. Let our wife do the talking. And in doing so, we deprive our children of a, of a listening ear and an open heart. Sometimes our, our children look to us for some kind of affirmation, some kind of acceptance from us, even just a listening ear. St. Joseph's silence is not indifference or coldness. It is this attentive listening. He is completely engaged. He is totally there for the Christ child. I mean, that's where the Christ child learned manhood. He took to himself human flesh exclusively from his mother. But where did he learn what it meant to be a man? How did he understand manhood? The great artist Esteban Murillo has this wonderful depiction of St. Joseph who looks just like Jesus, if you look at it closely. And you realize that Jesus would have looked at that face of that man and loved that man. And we become what we love, just as we become what we hate. But we become what we love. And if we look long enough at someone, we become like them. Sometimes husbands and wives end up looking like brother and sister. <laughs> I think sometimes in my parish some of them actually are, but I don't say that out loud. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Don't record that. Blot that out. We become what we look at. We become whom we love. And that is why Eucharistic adoration was done most perfectly by St. Joseph. He is the model of all those who adore the most blessed sacrament. Because while Jesus became a man looking at St. Joseph, St. Joseph became even more wonderfully holy by looking at the Son, by looking at the Mother. He was filled with grace upon grace precisely because he was able to contemplate God's most precious possessions. God's most precious possessions. And when it came to that one moment in time when he was setting out to find a place for the Word made flesh to be born, he went to the city of David. He took with him Mary, the mother of the child, his most beloved spouse, and they went to the city of David. And you know the story so well, because Christmas after Christmas we relive that that very painful situation, huh? painful. Thinking over it, it always gives us a terrible feeling. I mean, they didn't have travel agents in those days. There was no way you could plan ahead. You had to simply strike out, and with a hope, <laughs> you would find a place. And inevitably, you would find a place. Huh? The ancient world was filled with all sorts of hovels and hotels and motels. Everybody was in the swing of things. Eh? But one place after another, door after door, it would be enough for any man to lose his cool. Here you have your expectant wife riding on a donkey. <laughs> and you are expecting to find a place in your city, in which you have legitimate title, and door after door keeps slamming in your face. I don't suppose that St. Joseph stood there like a dish towel and just said, whoops, <laughs> sorry. I suppose that he got into some pretty heated discussions with those who would keep him and his spouse and the divine child out. But Scripture doesn't tell us that. But I quite like to think of his manly strength and courage saying to those fellers 
What do you mean you've got no room? You must have something here. But in his desperation, he is also a creative man. And this is why men have to see in St. Joseph a marvelous pattern. Okay, so things aren't great. Things are not going your way. What are you going to do? You're going to go nuclear for what? You're going to explode? St. Joseph didn't explode, but he found what he thought could be a remediable situation. He found a stable. Now, we all think to ourselves, how quaint, how pretty. It's a little manger bed. The place was full of crap. <laughs> and he could have been like some men who can see the bad side of everything. Huh? Or some guys who say it's a lovely day. And they will say it stinks. St. Joseph could see the good even in that stable. He had the creative Catholic imagination that was able to see, yeah, it's a dump. Yeah, there's a lot of crap. But you know what? I'm going to apply myself and I'm going to roll up my sleeves and I'm going to find the good in this. Now every single one of us has that as a challenge. To be able to find good where there is nothing but junk. You may find yourself in places and in families in which there is a lot of junk. But be like St. Joseph. Struggle hard. Roll up your sleeves. Make an effort. You can find some good there. And after the Christ child was, was born and they returned to Nazareth, after their flight into Egypt, we celebrate every year liturgically what is called the Feast of the Holy Family. I love that feast, and it always gets completely ignored because everybody's so gaga over Christmas, they forget about the Holy Family celebration. And it's a great celebration. And you know why it's great? Because you can look through every prayer book in every liturgical book, as many as you want, and you go and see if you can find the Feast of the Perfect Family. <laughs> and you will not find it. <laughs> it doesn't exist. And yet it does exist. Come on. Think of it for a moment. There you have the Son. He's God. <laughs> the Mother. She is the all-immaculate, all-holy. And St. Joseph, the just man. And St. Joseph is the least in that family, and he is the head of that family. Oh, I know, you're all rolling your eyes, thinking, okay, here we go with the headship talk. Okay, but before you get there, let me say this. It was a perfect family. There was no elements of dysfunction. Can you imagine the mother of God giving St. Joseph the silent treatment? <laughs> Can you imagine that? Can you imagine her putting her hip on, hand on her hip and saying, when are you going to get with the program? And poor St. Joseph saying, I didn't know there was a program. It was a perfect family. But we never called it a perfect family. We only call it a holy family. And I've often thought that is so interesting, eh? I think it's interesting because it is our church, our mother, our holy Catholic church, which is the one true church. And don't let anybody tell you any differently. There's only one church. Our holy mother, the church, says to all of us, born of Adam, born of Eve, that yes, you come from a dysfunctional family, but that is not the aspiring hope of being a perfect family. The desire is to be a holy family. And there's a difference between being perfect and being holy. Oh, it is such a revelation to understand this. It is a revelation because here's the thing. To be holy 
It means to have Christ in the center. You can be holy without being perfect. I mean to say, our Lord did say, be ye perfect, as my heavenly Father is perfect. But you know, he meant that in the context of mercy. He didn't mean that, that you must become perfectionists. Perfectionism is a neurosis. <laughs> Perfectionism is not the goal of multiplying many acts and doing it all absolutely perfectly. Holiness is something entirely different. Holiness is living in such a way as that Christ is in the soul. So you can be struggling with, I don't know what kind of sin, but you could be struggling and going to confession and repenting and being very simple and docile in spiritual direction and having Christ in the middle of your soul and that's holiness and that's a liberation that's a discovery that every one of us must understand because otherwise we will be thrown down we will become downcast we will become discouraged don't become discouraged brothers and sisters don't let the devil discourage you. The devil seeks nothing more than to dishearten you upon the path of holiness. And he would like us nothing better than for us to throw our hands in the air and say, I'm finished with this project called holiness. Because I can't manage to overcome this, therefore I'm out of here. I'm so sick and tired of this project. I'm not going to take it anymore. And that would delight the devil. Say, like, come along. That's great. Get fed up. <laughs> no. What he can't stand is the kind of person who, after they've been knocked down, gets back up and says, I'm going to go back to confession. I'm going to start all over again. I'm going to love our Lord even more. I'm going to do penance. And I'm going to make another attempt. That drives the devil crazy. And St. Joseph is that marvelous man who shows us of how to be determined and decisive disciples of Jesus. He shows us that this is a matter of complete and total obedience and humility to the Lord's plan. That, I would say, is St. Joseph's great glory. And it is a great pattern for modern men. Because as men, as far as that goes, we have so many poor models to follow. Huh? We have so many episodes in our modern age which, which does not give us a very proper understanding of what manhood means. Back in 1991, in my country of Canada, there was a terrible massacre that happened at a school in Montreal. I think there's a young girl here from Montreal. Are you here? You're not here. Oh, you are here. How about you give a little hoot and holler? Hi. <laughs> Bonjour, mes amis. In Montreal, there was a university there called L'Ecole Polytechnique. And there was, on December the 6th, a lone gunman by the name of Mark Lapine. And he went into this place, an engineering classroom filled with young men, young women, and he had a gun. And he demanded all the guys to leave. And then he shot 14 women. It was horrible. It was the first episode, really, in which Canada had seen the brutality and the savagery of a massacre. It was a massacre. About six months later, a group of university professors from my alma mater, the University of Western Ontario, decided we should commemorate this and make all men wear a white ribbon to show that they are opposed to male violence because that was an example of male violence. See? They thought Mark Lapine in that moment represented the worst in men that men are predators, that men are savages, that men are beasts, and that we must all suffer through this with guilt for our manhood. We should feel guilty for being men, see? But you see, Mark Lapine did not represent manhood. 
He didn't represent men. What is the tragedy that no one knows, or at least it was never told to us from the media, was that when he went into that classroom, he said to all the young men, you guys get out of here. They saw the gun, they knew what he was going to do, and they all walked out. Now, I don't know about you, but I know quite a few university guys, and they spend an awful lot of time at the gym and at the bar. But at the gym, they're like, oh, oh. they're macho men. Huh? Huh. And not one of them could find one muscle to take this guy down, to solve the problem. Their courage was entirely in their mouth. They did not do what a man ought to do. You see, St. Joseph put himself right in the firing line to defend the mother and child. He laid down his life in order to defend and protect, to serve the eternal word, to give himself completely in this work. And I think that that message must reach modern men. Because I think sometimes they look at the message of Catholic life and they think it's obnoxious because somehow or another we have this, this model of conversation that talks about our faith as a big celebration. We're all going to hold hands. and It becomes very annoying for men. We don't know anything about celebration. What we do know is that when we are summoned to sacrifice, Something goes off inside of us, and we want to give ourselves. We want to lay down our lives. It is the point of our existence. Uh, I don't know how much more time I have, but I must tell you this about Canada. Uh, if you never come to Canada, I will tell you about our very famous bird. We have a lovely bird called the Cardinal. Huh? He is a majestic creature. Oh, my. And I think that's where our, our cardinals get their colors. <laughs> because on a marvelous day, the cardinal, on a winter scenery, he is all decked out in red. Huh? He's got red feathers like he has just come from the salon and got it all colored by his hairdresser. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Magnificent creature. And he is out there looking around, and he stands out against all that white. But if you go look for Mrs. Cardinal, Mrs. Cardinal is wearing a bespeckled house dress. She's wearing just the ordinary, everyday, run-of-the-mill, discount bin Kmart special. <laughs> and you may say, well, that's a bit unfair, Almighty God. Could you not have given her a little color? At least a hat. <laughs> but you know, it tells us something very interesting for us men. Eh? The big cat who sees the red cardinal says, I'm going to eat Mr. Cardinal. <laughs> it tells us that men are expendable. Hmm? Because if Mr. Cardinal gets eaten, the next generation will grow up and Mrs. Cardinal will compensate. She will cover over and and take care of the little ones. Uh, but if Mrs. Cardinal gets eaten, uh, and Mr. Cardinal's still there, it's going to be TV dinners, and it's going to be all sorts of uh, unwashed laundry. It's not going to be easy. In all of this, we understand that we as men are meant to lay down our lives. Christ does it perfectly. St. Joseph does it perfectly. And that is the goal of our lives, is to lay down our life in sacrifice, in honor, and love for our spouse. And what greater honor is there than to lay down our lives for the spouse of Jesus Christ, our Holy Mother, the Church? There are many men and there are many women in this world today who are doing just that. In prisons dark and secret, they are laying down their lives for the sake of the bride. And our prayer should be for them to be strengthened and our prayer should also be for us that if that hour of need should come, we will be ready to lay down our lives for the sake of the spouse of Christ, which is the church. Well, I thank you for this opportunity to be with you today. I don't know what I ever did in my life to deserve to be with you Kiwis. 
it is such a privilege and an honor to be with you and to be able to touch the mystical body of Christ. Wow, it is a great privilege. I'll just invite you to a, a little get-together tonight. I didn't come to New Zealand by myself. Huh? I was thinking, well, it's so nice to go to New Zealand. Why enjoy it all by myself? I came with a very special friend of mine who I think is the reason why I got here in the first place. I have been working in a very unofficial way with this very inspiring layman named Michael Voris on, on Real Catholic TV. It is a very exciting uh, endeavor. I, I feel sometimes it's way beyond my pay grade. I get no pay for it, so that's why I can say it is beyond my pay grade. So I said to him, why don't we go to New Zealand and you go and you tell some very exciting things. So he came with me and we are having some talks in the nighttime. It's kind of like a, kind of like a bar scene where we are all getting together after the convention and hearing more exciting things and setting off fireworks, which I understand are illegal here in New Zealand. <laughs> I was so shocked when I found out that you can't have firecrackers. I thought, well, I better go home. <laughs> But I know it is in a place called Hota Petra. I don't know if I said it wrong or something. You will, you will laugh at my Canadian accent, but uh, that is something in the evening. If you are interested, you can come and see that event. It will be very interesting. But I thank you for coming to this Eucharistic convention. It is so inspiring to see your determination to love your Catholic faith and to do things for the Holy Church. So if I may give you my blessing before I go, the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, everyone.